This is the humerus, the large bone in the upper extremity. Let's focus in on the proximal end of the humerus. This is the proximal end of the humerus. This is the part of the humerus that will go into the shoulder. This part here, which you see is a nice rounded, smooth part of the bone, is called the head of the humerus. On the front of the humerus, the anterior side of the humerus, you will see now this rough projection out of the bone. This is the lesser tubercle. On the lateral and posterior part of the humerus, you'll find this larger projection is called the greater tubercle. Between the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle, you will see this large groove. This large groove is for the tendon for the biceps brachii to go through and go to it where it attaches to the scapula. This large groove is called the intertubercular sulcus. If we had the humerus and we could cut off this proximal end right about here, we would call this imaginary spot the surgical neck. For the most part, the diaphysis or the shaft of the humerus is pretty boring, but if we scan down the diaphysis, there is one part that we do need to know, and it's this part right here, this rough swelling on the shaft of the bone. This rough swelling is called the deltoid tuberosity. It is the attachment point for the deltoid muscle. Let's now go to the distal end of the humerus. This is the anterior view of the distal end of the humerus. At that distal end, we can see that there is this very unique structure where there are three hills. This hill and this groove and this middle hill is called the trochlea. It is the joint attachment spot for the ulna. Superior to the trochlea, you will see this depression called the coronoid fossa. This lateral swelling is called the capitulum. On either side of the distal end of the humerus, you see these pieces of bone that stick out in either direction. These are called the epicondyles. This one that sticks out further is called the medial epicondyle. This one that sticks out less on the side of the capitulum is called the lateral epicondyle. If we turn this bone over, we will see a large depression right above the trochlea. This is called the olecranon fossa. How do you tell the difference between a right and a left humerus? The things that you need to look for are the head and the trochlea capitulum combination. Remember that the trochlea capitulum combination will always be to the anterior. The head will always be to the medial side. This particular humerus belongs to the left side of the body. Compare it with this humerus where you can see the trochlea capitulum combination here in the anterior and the head here. This 
belongs to the right side of the body. This is the ulna, the second bone in the upper extremity. Let's focus on the proximal end of the ulna. The most distinct thing that you will find about the ulna is this U-shaped notch at the proximal end of the ulna. This U-shaped notch is called the semilunar notch or the trochlear notch. I like to think that this U-shaped notch means that this U is for ulna. At this end of this U-shaped notch, you will find a projection called the olecranon process. And at this end of the notch, you will find a projection called the coronoid process. If we turn the bone this way, you will see on the side of the coronoid process there is another depression here. This depression is for the head of the next bone, the radius. This is called the radial notch. If we move now to the distal end of the bone, you will see at the very distal end of the bone there is a piece of bone that sticks out the bottom. This piece of bone is called the styloid process. How can you identify a right or left ulna? The structures to look for in this are the trochlear notch and the radial notch. Remember the trochlear notch should always be facing your front or the anterior side of your body. The radial notch should always be to your lateral side. This particular ulna belongs to the right side of your body. Let's compare that with this ulna, which you can see is different. Trochlear notch to the anterior, radial notch to the lateral side. This particular ulna belongs to the left side of the body. This is the radius, the second bone in the forearm, part of the upper extremity. Let's focus on the proximal end of the radius. The big thing that you notice about the proximal end of the radius is that the head is a circle. This is how the radius got its name, because halfway across a circle is a radius. Just below the head, you will see this narrowing. This is called the neck. And then distal to that, you see that the bone swells out again. This is the radial tuberosity. Again, if we go and focus on the distal end of the bone, you will see that there is another portion of the bone that sticks out way at the distal end. This is the styloid process of the radius. How do you tell a right radius from a left radius? Again, the structures that you need to look for are the radial tuberosity and the styloid process. In the radius, the radial tuberosity should always be facing towards your front or towards your anterior. The styloid process should always be over your thumb. So if you put it up against your forearm like this, see with my radial tuberosity forward and my styloid process over my thumb, you will see that this belongs to my left forearm. This is a left radius. Compare that to this radius, which you can see is the opposite mirror image, and you see that their radial tuberosity is forward, your styloid process is on the opposite side. This is a right radius.
This is a left hand. The small bones in the proximal part of the hand, in the wrist, are called carpals. We have eight carpals in total. Each one of these carpals has an individual name. The names of these are as follows. Scaphoid. Lunate. Triquetrum. Pisiform. Hamate. Capitate. Trapezium. And trapezoid. I leave it up to you to look on the internet to find the cool mnemonic devices out there to remember the names of these bones. There are quite a few of them and some of them are quite interesting to learn. The middle bones of the hand that make up most of the palm of the hand are called metacarpals. These metacarpals are numbered according to which finger they belong to. So they are numbered from lateral to medial. This bone here, which is part of the thumb, is called metacarpal 1. This bone, metacarpal 2. This bone, metacarpal 3. This bone, metacarpal 4. And this bone, metacarpal 5. The fingers are called phalanges. Phalanges is a plural term. The singular term for phalanges is phalanx. So each one of these bones is a phalanx. They are numbered and also named for their position within your fingers. If they are the bone touching the metacarpal, they are called proximal phalanx. So this is proximal phalanx 1, proximal phalanx 2, proximal phalanx 3, proximal phalanx 4, proximal phalanx 5. The middle bone in your finger is only found on the four fingers other than your thumb. So this is a middle phalanx 2, middle phalanx 3, middle phalanx 4, and middle phalanx 5. The distal bones are called distal phalanx, and again the thumb has a distal, so distal phalanx 1, distal phalanx 2, distal phalanx 3, distal phalanx 4, and distal phalanx 5. The most common mistake that students make when they're identifying these bones is they want to call this bone proximal phalanx 1. Remember, the first finger, the thumb, does not have three bones in its thumb. It only has two. This bone, remember, is metacarpal 1.